often um, when two opposing um, personalities come together, they can sometimes drive forward and push forward ideas because of that slight tension that they wouldn't have done otherwise. Also, I think that if you look at uh, President Hollande's personality, his temperament, he sold himself to the French electorate as Monsieur Normal. Um, that is much more similar to uh, Merkel's style and personality than, than, President Sar than former President Sarkozy. So I think there are reasons to be uh, optimistic. However, when the champagne corks were popping on Place de la Bastille, the only people celebrating in Greece were the hard right and the hard left. And what happened that evening on May 6th in Greece and the subsequent week where no government was able to be formed is truly very, very worrying. And we've seen the repercussions of that in recent days and weeks with turmoil on the markets, um, Spanish borrowing costs are at a record high. We've seen that the Eurosceptics in my country who like to say that Greece could just simply re-adopt the drachma in an orderly way and it would all be absolutely fine are having themselves on because even uh, with Greece in the Eurozone, with the turmoil in Greece, that is having already an effect, a contagion effect on some of the other Eurozone economies. And let's be frank, Greece is 2% of Eurozone GDP and Spain is the fourth largest Eurozone economy and I think it's around 12% of Eurozone GDP, so it's much, much more significant uh, if trouble um, were to, if, if, if Spain were to get into trouble. Now, let me also say that politicians often talk about the figures and um, the debt levels and the deficit levels and the bailout fund and this and that, but I think it's certainly worth emphasising, as Dennis has already done, the human cost of this crisis, whether it's young people in Spain with an incredibly high unemployment rate there, or whether it's Greek people in desperation, um, killing themselves, literally, um, because the suicide levels in Greece are going up, the numbers are going up, or not having enough to eat. These things are happening on our doorstep. They're in Europe. But on that point of pessimism, let me set out three reasons to be optimistic. And I did find three. It took me a while, but I, I got there. And the first is that recent weeks have served to undermine that the Eurozone crisis isn't purely a sovereign debt crisis. Yes, it's true that in Greece uh, it's a debt crisis. That is certainly the case. They've got a growth crisis as well. They've got a lack of growth. But if um, you look at the uh, situation in Spain, it's incredibly different. Spain's debt to GDP levels are lower than Germany's. Spain only broke the um, stability and growth pact when the crash hit in 2008, they were one of the good pupils in the class, one of the very few good pupils who kept to the rules until as late as 2008. In Spain, the economic situation has been caused by um, household debt and private sector debt and a, a housing boom, uh, the bubble of which burst. So I think it's wrong to say that uh, European prices purely down to uh, levels of public spending. Yes, it's a massive problem in, in, in Greece, but in Spain and Ireland and elsewhere, there are other significant problems with the euro that I think now the German government are coming round to. Only recently, uh, the finance minister took us all by surprise by saying that he thought salaries in Germany should rise and that if they were to increase, that that would serve to correct some of the weaknesses in the euro, hence um, the fact that German exports have been incredibly successful in intra-EU, intra-Eurozone, but also with the outside um, world, and that the lack of demand in Germany is part of, uh, a lack of consumption is, is part of that problem. So there are deeper imbalances apart from the fact that the rules were broken with regard to public spending that needs to be addressed. And I'm glad that the German government, the German finance minister, have uh, started to recognise that. Um, the second reason to be optimistic is going back to President Hollande's victory. 
there is definitely a shift now away from austerity alone. Even before Francois Hollande won on the 6th of May, Marion Draghi from the ECB was calling for a growth pact. Mario Monti, Prime Minister of Italy, had already been arguing for months that um, it would be impossible to bring the deficit and debt levels down without growth. But what does that actually mean? Now, I think there is a slight division between when people say growth and promoting growth, what do they actually mean by that? And I think some on the right are in danger of thinking that painful structural reform, which is needed in some cases to improve competitiveness, not, well, we'll have a conversation about which type of structural reform, but certainly there is a need for structural reform. But that in itself does not promote growth in the short term. Uh, Mario Monti, when I met him with Ed Miliband in the autumn, said, um, privately, but he said it publicly since, I think I'm allowed to repeat it, that the present German government think that economics is a branch of moral philosophy. And it's almost as if the Germans think this is the moment that we can drive reform in these weaker economies and it's the only leverage we're going to have to make these economies and these countries and their, their governments um, take a hit, do the structural reform. But the truth is, this structural reform is painful. And as I say, it might be a good thing to do in the medium to long term, but in the short term, um, there needs to be some kind of stimulus. And I think that President Obama is, is showing the way on this. He's showing that there is an alternative, that he um, had a very big fiscal stimulus, he also saved the car industry. Um, and now the American economy is growing and unemployment is falling. They're not where they need to be, don't get me wrong, it's still not um, a, a, uh, a rosy picture in the States, but things are improving and he's shown that he can do that and bring the deficit down. And the um, final reason to be optimistic is that overall, although the emphasis is is, has been on Greece and Spain and Portugal and Ireland. Overall, the Eurozone, as Dennis has already set out, has lower deficit and debt levels than some of the big developed economies in the world, such as the United States, um, and uh, if I'm not being too modest, such as the UK, our debt and deficit levels are larger than the uh, average Eurozone debt and deficit levels. So let me say in, in conclusion that there is an urgency to sorting out this crisis. There have been mistakes made. Um, there should have been more emphasis on in helping Greece promote uh, growth, whether that's through investment in infrastructure, um, as well as some of the painful reforms that they need to carry out. Because Europe can and should be a force for good in the world. However, it spent, their, its leaders have spent so much time and energy trying to tackle this crisis, that the other um, massive globalised problems that we're all facing, such as climate change, such as the instability of the uh, financial system, these big global challenges are exactly the things that Europe should be focusing on, but for as long as there's a crisis in the Eurozone, it cannot dedicate, uh, the European Union cannot dedicate the, the, the sufficient time and energy to tackling uh, those challenges. And also the ongoing crisis makes it very difficult for people like myself, who is a pro-European by the way, and British, um, Dennis and I and Wayne David and others are here to show you that not everybody in the UK is uh, anti-European, but it's making it very difficult to make that argument, both in the UK and elsewhere. And we're seeing a rise in populism on, on the right and on the left, and that is tremendously worrying. But I think it is within Europe's grasp Je pense qu'il faut poser la question de fond. Est-ce qu'on peut être sur l'Europe dans la longue distance et pas seulement dans la quotidiennité Être optimiste, pessimiste ou bien autre chose Alors, pour, euh, puisque je suis français, j'ai quand même été un peu surpris de votre optimisme concernant les élections, je n'ai pas pris de position ni pour Sarkozy ni pour Hollande, parce que j'ai trouvé que les deux s'enfermaient dans 
le franco-français. Il n'a pas été question ni de Poutine, ni de la Syrie, ni de la Chine, etc. Et vous avez terminé votre discours en disant qu'il y a des problèmes quand même très importants dans le monde dont les gouvernements ne parlent pas. Mais c'est encore plus grave qu'on n'en parle pas dans les campagnes électorales. Ça tempère, si vous voulez, mon optimisme. Je suis pour le champagne, y compris place de la Bastille, mais ça ne suffit pas à me satisfaire. La seule question de, de politique concrète mondiale qui a été posée par Hollande, c'est le retrait des troupes françaises d'Afghanistan un peu plus vite que tout le monde. C'est pas très, 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 très brillant. Hein. Ça fait toujours plaisir aux gens de retirer leurs troupes. Mais il faudrait quand même penser aux femmes afghanes. Il faudrait quand même penser à ces gens qui risquent de, de nouveau, tomber sous la dictature des talibans et réfléchir à deux fois avant de dire « je retire mes troupes ». Enfin, passons. Je crois qu'il faut essayer de poser la question plus, plus généralement. Est-ce qu'il y a quelque chose à espérer de l'Europe Ou faut-il en désespérer Commençons par citer quelqu'un d'extrêmement connu qui est mort. C'est Jean-Paul II, le pape, le précédent pape. Et le précédent pape était désespéré. Il disait... Les Européens vivent comme si Dieu n'existait pas. Et beaucoup de critiques de l'Europe, y compris quand ils sont Européens, disent que ce n'est pas la question tellement de Dieu, mais c'est la question du bien commun. Les Grecs se disputent avec les Allemands, qui se disputent avec le peuple méditerranéen, comme ils disent, les Français trouvent aussi que l'Allemagne est arrogante, mais les Allemands trouvent que les Français sont arrogants, etc. Est-ce qu'il y a quelque chose à espérer de ce qu'on appelle une communauté européenne Alors, je pense prendre le contre-pied des pessimistes. Oui, l'Europe n'a pas d'idée commune de Dieu. Pire encore, l'Europe n'a pas une idée commune du bien commun. Alors, il y a beaucoup de gens qui disent leur fin. Les Chinois, ils sont à la fois Confucius et communistes, et ça donne une solidité. Les, les, les musulmans, bon, ils ont le Coran. Même les Américains, ils ont la Bible. Et Poutine, en Russie, ben, la Russie a Poutine, un nouveau tsar. C'est-à-dire 300, 500 ans d'histoire. Alors, qu'est-ce que c'est l'Europe c'est pas un pays sans boussole, mais c'est un pays qui n'a pas la boussole du bien commun. C'est un pays qui a comme boussole, comme pôle, pour regarder, pour déchiffrer l'avenir, la boussole du mal commun. Alors je vais expliquer par des exemples très simples. Quand après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, il y a eu L'Europe occidentale qui a essayé de se réunir, elle s'est réunie à la fois avec les catholiques, les protestants, les socialistes, les, les libéraux, etc. Eux non plus n'avaient pas d'idéal commun. Mais ils avaient des dangers, des risques, des refus communs. C'était une Europe démocratique. Elle était démocratique parce qu'elle ne voulait pas du communisme de l'autre côté du réseau de fer, elle ne voulait pas de retourner, le risque de retourner à quelque chose de xénophobe, raciste et finalement fasciste et hyperlu. Et puis finalement, ça n'a pas été dit, mais ça a été quand même accompli, elle ne voulait plus de ces guerres coloniales. Il a fallu que la France perde deux guerres coloniales pour qu'elle devienne vraiment européenne. 